Hi, my name is Met Hatel Masri. Today I'm going to give you an introduction into Entity Framework. And for this demo, we're simply going to use a command line application. For the database server, I'm going to use SQL Server running in a Docker container. And my sample database is a database that we will create and it comprises of two tables an instructor table and a courses table. First of all, let's start our database server. And as I said, I'm going to use a Docker container running SQL Server. But in your case, you could use SQL Express. You can use SQL Server running anywhere else. The first thing I will do is inside of a terminal window. And here is my terminal window. I'm going to run the command for starting a Docker container. The command will be this one here. I'm going to start this image, run it as a container, and the SA password is SQL password exclamation. The database is going to be accessible through port 1444. So I'm going to take this and run it in a terminal window. And when I do that, you get this GUID, this shows that the container has been given an ID. Now, if I want to know whether it's running or not, I can type in Docker PS, and here it says it's been running for 22 seconds. I will create the database using Azure Data Studio, and this is Azure Data Studio. At the moment, I'm not connected to any database. In order to connect to a database, I can click on new, new connection. For the server, I will enter local host and comma 1444. Notice that you put a comma and not a colon between local host and 1444. For the username, I'm going to enter SA and the password is going to be the password that I showed you before when I started the container. And I will check remember password. And as you can see here, it has connected to the database. Now, if you look at the databases that are available, there's only these four system databases. We want to create our own database. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to right click on localhost and request a new query window. We're going to get a new query window and in here, I'm going to execute the commands for creating my database. The source code for this demo is available on GitHub. You will find the script for creating this database. I will paste it here and go through the code itself. So the first thing we want to do is use master. Master is this table that we saw here among the system tables. So I want to use master in order to check whether this school database is already there. If the database is already there, I'm going to drop it. And then I will create a new database called school. I will use the school database and create an instructors table. And this is what the instructors table looks like. It's got a primary key instructor ID that's of type identity, which means that it gets incremented automatically by the database. And it's got last name, first name, and email columns in addition to the primary key. Here I'm inserting into the instructors table five instructors. The next thing is I'm going to create the courses table and the courses table has columns course ID, course name, course description and credits. And it's also got an instructor ID column which is a foreign key into the instructor's ID column in the instructor's table. And finally I'm going to insert 10 courses into the courses table. So at this point if I run this script, it should create for me the new database. You don't see the database now, but in order to see it, you can right click on databases and click on refresh. And here it is, we have our school database and it's got two tables. We can view the data in the instructors table and we can also view the data in the courses table. So as far as we're concerned, we have created the database and we have inserted some sample data. So at this point, I will close my Azure Data Studio as I do not need it anymore. 
the next step for us is to create a console application that allows us to interact with this data in the sample school database. Find yourself a suitable workspace on your computer and let us now create a console application. And I will use the .NET command, new console and the output directory, I will call it school db. I'm going to go into that school db folder. And if you haven't done already, you need to have a utility also called a tool that is .NET hyphen EF installed on your machine. So I'm going to enter the command in order to install that utility. And basically this command is, I made a typo here, And basically this command is .NET tool install minus G's for global. And this is the name of the utility .NET EF. I'll hit enter and I get a message saying this is already installed, but I will update it. So I'm going to replace the install switch here to update and it should update it for me to the latest version. We need to add some packages so that our application can talk to SQL Server. You need to add these packages to your application. I'm going to copy this and paste it into here. And these packages will be added to our application, which means that we can now talk to SQL Server using Entity Framework from within our console application. How do we get our application to know about the school database. Well, the utility that we installed, which is .NET EF, it can reverse engineer the database into our application. By reverse engineer, what is meant is that we can query the database and get it to find out what tables are in that database. And then it will create the classes and the objects that are necessary to talk to the database. The command I'm about to execute is this command. I'll be using the .NET EF utility. The switch is DB context scaffold. And this is the connection string here. The database server is located at localhost and port number 1444. The database I want to talk to is called school. The user ID is SA and this is the password. So the context class that will be created in our application is called school context. You can call it whatever you want. And I would like all the classes that are going to be created to be placed in a folder called school. Again, this is something that you decide. I'm going to take this, copy it and run it in the terminal window here. At this point, if we go into our application, we should see that a new folder has been created and it's got the objects that we need in order to talk to the database. And here it is. We have now a school folder and we've got a course class. And this course class represents the courses table in the database. And the instructor class represents the instructor table in the database. And you can see here that the relationship between the instructor and courses has been portrayed here. This means that the instructor can teach multiple courses. And also if you go to the course table, you have a foreign key instructor ID that relates to the instructor primary key in the instructor table. Now this is an important class, the school context. The school context, it contains the connection string and there is a warning here that says to protect potentially sensitive information in your connection string, you should move it out of the source code, which means basically that it's a bad idea to put a connection string inside of the code. Going back to the school context class, this is pretty much the entry point. Now I'm going to close this and let's go into the program.cs file, which is the main application. Of course, if you run this application, all it's going to say is hello world. So we're going to delete this and we're going to repurpose this application in order to talk to our database. The first thing I want to do is to instantiate a school context class and I'll just call it context equals to new school context. 
Of course, the school context has to be resolved and you need to import this namespace, schooldb.school, which really represents the namespace for this context class. The next thing is, let us read some data from the database. And I'm going to create a method here called get instructors. And we simply create a variable that you can call anything. I'm going to call it data and ask the context to give us all the instructors. As simple as that. And then we iterate using the for each statement through the instructors collection. So var item in data. And I'm going to do a console.write line in here. I'm going to do a string interpolation. So I'm going to put a placeholder for the instructor ID followed by a tab, a placeholder for the first name followed by a tab, another placeholder for the last name followed by a tab, then finally a placeholder for the email. So in here I'm going to say item dot instructor ID. The next one will be item dot first name, then item dot last name, and finally item dot email and a semicolon. Now if I call this method from here get instructors, I should be able to see some instructors. Let's go in the terminal window and see what happens, I'm going to go .NET run. You can see that it returned for me data from the database. I am going to be creating a lot of methods. So I'm going to introduce you to a menu system so that we can have options that we can choose. So it's a very basic menu system. And this is the code I'm going to use. I'm going to put that menu system instead of this get instructors. As you can see here, this is a method called main menu. At the moment, we have two options, zero to exit and one to display instructors. And if you look at case one here, it calls the get instructors. All of these cases they return are true. The only one that returns a false is zero because with that, we are going to exit the application. So in order to call the main menu method, I'm going to add this code here. I'm going to set show menu to true. And while show menu is true, it keeps on looping and main menu returns show menu. So the only case that will cause this loop to break is if the user enters zero, it's going to return a false, then it will come out of this loop. So now let us run this application with our menu system. So I'm going to go .NET run. And if I enter zero, I will exit. If I run again and I enter one, it's going to display for me the instructors. I do one again and it will keep on looping until I hit zero and it exits. Let's see how we can use the where statement in Entity Framework. And the where statement is used in case you want to filter out a group of records based on some condition. So for that purpose, I'm going to copy this and paste it down here. And let's say I want instructors with first name starting with J, for example. So I'll put a where statement here, where given an instructor I, I want to find all the instructors. First name starts with, and I can put a J here. So it's as simple as that. Now I'm going to take this and put it into my case statement for number two, which is the first one available, put a semicolon here and add a menu item number two. Let me copy this and add a new menu for number two. And I'll say display instructors with first name starting with J. And now let's see if it does what we expect it to do. So I'm going to enter two here and you can see it only selected Joe Sun. How about if we want to sort data? And that means that we would use the order by statement. So I'm going to again copy this here and repurpose it. So let's say get instructors sorted by first name. So down here we can say order by and give an instructor 
we're going to ask for that instructor to be sorted by first name. Now let us add this to the menu system. So we start by putting it in the first available case and then we're going to add menu item for number three and here I'm going to change this to three display instructors sorted by by first name so let's run this application and see if it does what we want it to do I enter three here and you can see that the names are sorted by first name because we start with Anne and end with Tom so I'll exit out of here how about if you want to optimize the performance of your query statement by only selecting specific columns because the way things are going here it is probably selecting all the columns and to prove that what we can do is come over to this last method that we created and we can do a query on this data object it's got a method called to query string and this needs to be imported it belongs to the Microsoft Entity Framework core namespace. Now if I want to print out this query that is being sent to the database I can do console.writeline and print this out. So now let us run this again to see what is the query statement that's being sent to the database. So if I run this again enter 3 here this is the query statement. It is requesting the instructor ID, the email, the first name, the last name. So maybe we're just interested in two columns, not all the columns. Now, this is important if you have a table that has too many columns and you're just interested, maybe out of 30 columns, you're just interested in three columns. So what's the point of making that query for many columns when you need only two columns? You're going to make your application much faster and you're going to save in bandwidth. So let's select, say, just two columns. In the next example, I'm going to repurpose this. I'll copy it, bring it down here, and I'll say get instructors only the names, nothing else just the first name and the last name. So I can say select and then let's say instructor here. Then I'll say new and all I want is the first name and the last name. So this is what it's going to look like. You're going to get an error down here because these columns are not being requested. So we can delete this and delete this. So there are only two columns coming in. Now let me take this line just to inspect the SQL statement that's being sent to the database. Let's add this to our menu system and the next available is number four and say here that we are going to select only specific columns. So I'll say number four, select only first and last names. Let's run this application and see what it does. So there seems to be an error on line 101. Let's go and see what's on line 101. I have two braces here. So let's run it again. So I'll select number four. And you can see here that our SQL statement is a little bit more optimized. It's just going to call for first name and last name. In other words, only two columns are going to be requested from the database. The next thing I want to show you is how you can alias the columns. In other words, giving them another name. Let me copy this and repurpose it here. Get instructor only by names and let's say aliased. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that I can give it a name called full name here and that full name will be the first name. Maybe we want to concatenate a space and then concatenate the last name. So it will look something like this. Now we get an error because we don't have these columns anymore. What we have is just full name. So I'm going to come here and just put full name. So that fixes it. Let's take this method and add it in our case statement and add an option here. So this would be number five. Let's say select all only first and last names. Let's put a space here. 
instead of just saying first name and last name i'm gonna say display full names now let us run our application again and we have an error and this is on line 45 so let's look at line 45 i forgot a semicolon here so let's run it again number five and now you can see this sql statement it is doing the concatenation on the server it's saying grab the first name put a space then the last name as full name so all of this is being done on the server side next how about if we want to get a report of all the courses that the instructors are teaching up to now we've only worked with one table which is the instructors table but there's a relationship between instructors and courses so if we want to find out the number of courses that each instructor is giving then we need to do some sort of a group by join kind of statement but with entity framework you don't have to worry about join because as long as you work with relationships the join happens in the background so let me exit out of here and let's add a new method to our application consider this code there's a method here called get course count by instructor we're going to first query all the courses and include the instructor information with each course row we're going to group by instructor first name and instructor last name and we want to select the first name space last name and display the count and we want to order by descending why do we want to order by descending well let's say we want to know instructor that teaches the most we put that at the top and the instructor that teaches the least we put that at the bottom and here we're going to iterate through the name and the count only so let's add this to the next available case put a semicolon here and over here i will copy this paste make this number six and let's say display course count by instructor so let's see what happens we'll run our application choose number six as as you can see here the two people that are teaching the most courses are Anne Fay and Ben Lee Sue is teaching two courses Tom Max and Joe San are teaching one each so this gives us an example of how to use the group by statement now we haven't added updated or deleted data so let's add a method here void insert instructor when you insert an instructor you don't need to insert the instructor id column you just need to insert the first name the last name and the email so let me add these variables first name string last name and finally string email how do we add an instructor the first thing is you have to instantiate an instructor so i'm going to say var instructor equals to new and i'll instantiate an instructor which is one of these and i will set the various properties so i'll say the first name will be fn the last name will be ln and the email will be just simply email and once you have instantiated an instructor object you ask the context class to give you a list of instructors and you want to add into that list the instructor that you just instantiated as simple as that and then you just ask the context class to save the changes let us test this out so let me go down to option number seven in the case statement and here i'm going to call the insert instructor and ask it to enter first name tim last name day and email would be tim at day.com put a semicolon here now i want to see that we have indeed inserted this record so right after the insertion i'm going to call the get instructors method right here in our menu system let me say i want to add instructors so i'm going to change this to item 7 and say add instructor let's run the application and see if it does it I'll exit run the application again choose number 7 and look what happened here we have a new tim day record 
So how about updating data? So I'll go to the bottom again. So let me add another method and I'll call it update email, for example, if I just want to update the email. So in order to update a record, I need to have the ID and let's say the email address that I want to update it to. The first thing I need to do is find the instructor that I want to update. So I can say var instructor equals to context dot instructors dot find. We'll find you the instructor by primary key and the primary key is simply ID. Now I need to check if the instructor has been found or not. If the instructor has not been found, the instructor object will be null. So I can say if instructor is not equals to null, then I have found the instructor. I'll set the instructor email to be this email that's being passed. And then I will ask the context to save the changes. This should be a semicolon here. Else we can find it. So I can put an error message here. Simply I'll say console dot write line and maybe put an interpolation string here and I'll say instructor with ID equals to cannot be found. And for the ID, I'll just put the ID variable here. So let's see if this works. We copy this method here and add this to our case statement. And for ID, I'm going to search for ID number six, which is the last record we entered. And let me say for email, I'm going to say Tim day at outlook.com. Put a semicolon here and let's add item eight to our menu system. So instead of add, I'm going to say update. One last thing I'd like to do is after I update, I would like to display the instructors just to make sure that it updated the record I'm interested in. So now let's run our application, choose number eight. And what have we got here? Number six has been changed to Tim dat at outlook.com. Obviously I made a typo here, but that's fine. Finally, the last thing I want to do is to show you how to delete. So to delete, it's very similar to update in the sense that you have to find the record first that you want to delete. And let me repurpose this, call this delete. And when you delete, all you need to do is search by ID. So I'm going to search for the ID. If I don't find it, I'm going to say the ID cannot be found. But here, what we do is we ask the context class to give us all the instructors. And then there's a method called remove and we will remove this instructor object. And that's it. Save the changes and it should delete the instructor. I'll rename this to just simply delete instructor. Let's take this method, put it into the switch statement. And this is our last item. And let's say we want to delete item number six. And let's also display all the instructors to make sure that it's been deleted. I'm going to come here and add item number nine in the menu system. And this will be delete instructor. Let me run this application, delete instructor number nine. And when I delete instructor, you can see that it ends with number five, number six is gone. I hope you found this video useful and I'll see you in the next video.